side quests. Part 1 Hudson Well, boys, it's time to get to work. Hudson, a tall, burly man with a curtain of black hair that hung down his forehead, and a thick mustache under an equally thick nose, looked up from his seat by the fire and over at the man that had spoken. Bolson was, in his usual way, far more excitable and really loud than he would ever quite get used to. But they'd been working together for years now. Ever since his father, Benson, died when he was a child, he had been working alongside Bolson. He was Bolson's most experienced carpenter, and his second in command on days that the boss was busy working on the business side of Bolson Construction. Bolson was his usual colorful self as he walked up to the fire where Hudson and the new hire, Carson, sat, or lay in Carson's case. He was shorter than Hudson by a head, balding on top, but with a line of gray hair around the sides and the back of his head. His goatee was immaculately trimmed as always. He wore an open-fronted blue jacket and a pair of shockingly pink pants, freshly dyed. Around his waist, he wore various tools of his trade, hammers, chisels, wood saws, and a number of other tools. Hudson never had an eye for detailed work, like Bolson had. Instead, he typically oversaw the heavy lifting and building, and left fine carving for the boss and the few others that excelled in such work in their crew. Of course, none of them would be doing the finer aspects of their job today, no, today was a day for destruction, not construction. After a lot of arguments and debates, the mayor of Hatano Village and his council finally decided to tear down the old house just outside the village. It was an old house, full of ancient memories of people long dead, though it had also supposedly been owned by a famous soldier from the village before the calamity. None of that really mattered to him, though. Hudson tended to prefer less clutter. If something wasn't needed, then why keep it around? Bolson didn't quite agree. He wanted to keep the house around for sentimental value, even though it stood in an excellent location for his own business expansion. He claimed that his grandfather used to be friends with the old soldier. But sentimental value did not outweigh the clinking of rupees in Bolson's mind, so he agreed to take the job of destroying the house despite his reservations, provided he kept the land for new construction projects. He would not only get paid for tearing the house down, but would get paid again when he sold the new construction. Assuming it would sell, of course. The most recent homes that they built hadn't sold yet. Not many new people came to Hatano Village these days. Get up, Carson, Hudson said in his gruff voice. He slowly stood up, back cracking as he did so. In the tree overhead, several birds began to chirp excitedly once he moved. Perhaps they'd been still for so long that the birds forgot they were there. No matter. To his side, Carson groaned and sat up, running his hands through his short brown hair. He was a young man newly hired into Bolson Construction, and barely able to tell the difference between a joint and a joist. But he was earnest and a hard worker. It was no wonder that he was picked out by Bolson to work directly with him and Hudson, while the other sons worked on other projects. True, Hudson would have preferred to have at least another couple of workers with them for the project, maybe Nelson or Bryson, but he would settle for the three of them. They could handle the teardown and leave the cleanup to another crew. Bolson walked up, swinging his arms as though he lacked a care in the world and smiling broadly. Sleep well, did you, Carson? Oh, yeah. Sorry, boss, Carson said, face reddening. Oh, no, no need to apologize, said Bolson, waving his hands empathetically. I imagine that girlfriend of yours keeps you up late at night. He grinned broadly as Carson began to sputter, only growing redder in the face. Now, however, it is time to awaken your inner animal. We are beasts of construction. Hudson blew out a long breath through his mustache, but Carson seemed reinvigorated by Bolson's exuberance. He leaped to his feet, clenching his fists. I'm ready, boss. Say it with me. We are beasts of construction. Hudson? Hudson remained silent. Bolson looked at Hudson and scoffed. Hudson shrugged. Bolson sighed, but then perked back up, smiling broadly. Okie doo. His voice took on a sing-song quality as he clapped his hands together. Let's go to work! The initial stages of the deconstruction of the house were simple enough. They had already surveyed it, 
looking for the weak structural links that could bring the whole building down. But Bolson was nothing but thorough, so they surveyed it again, making marks on beams and walls. This was both to help them tear the house down faster, but also served as a caution. It wouldn't do for one of them to bring the house down, with them still in it after all. When that was complete, Bolson set them to begin removing anything still in or around the house. The house had largely been emptied over the last century, but a few pieces of broken furniture still remained. The loft had an almost complete bed, though one of its joints had been broken and the mattress, rotten and full of pests, had long since been removed. Hudson was impressed by the craftsmanship of the house. The house was well over 100 years old, and had been empty since the calamity, yet it still remained in surprisingly good condition. The roof needed some work, but it was still stable, and the wood inside was mostly free of rot. The stairs leading up to the loft creaked but did not bend or give way as he and Carson walked on them. Even he had to admit that it was a shame to tear down such a lovingly made home. Still, a job was a job. That's why he was surprised when Bolson cried out to him to stop just as he was raising his sledgehammer to break in one of the walls. A second later, Carson stuck his head out from around the corner, where he'd been removing the rotting front door. Hudson looked over at Bolson, who was standing next to a short man with long, dirty blonde hair, wearing a very bright blue tunic. Strangely, he had a sword and shield strapped to his back, and a strange rectangular device on his hip. He couldn't remember ever seeing him around Hatsuna Village before. He stepped closer to where Bolson and the man were having their discussion. Well, you're just a little go-getter, aren't you? Bolson said. He glanced up at Hudson and tipped him a small wink, something that the stranger probably easily saw him do. He looked back down at the man. And you have all that to give me for the new house, right? Well, no, the blonde man said. But I can get it. I really just need you to hold off on destroying this house until I can. Bolson looked down at the man, raising his hand and tapping his lips. You know that some people really do want to see this house gone. Are you worried about making them angry? A stranger coming into town buying up a condemned house. It's very mysterious. For all of his professional caution, Bolson was clearly excited by the potential drama that could unfold as a result of all of this. Personally, Hudson doubted there would be any such drama. His boss tended to exaggerate. I'm not quite a stranger, the young man said, reaching up and rubbing the back of his neck underneath his ponytail. And you definitely want this house. You've seen it, right? It's old, outdated, fallen apart. Why, we just built the new houses across the bridge, which are far more modern and come pre-furnished. No, I need... The man hesitated, reconsidering before continuing. I'd really like to buy this house. Bolson continued to gaze at the man, tapping his lips thoughtfully. Finally, he smiled. Well, you clearly know what you won't intend to pursue it. He chuckled softly. <laughs> Reminds me of me, from back in the day. All right, look, Bolson leaned in, whispering conspiratorially, though still easily loud enough that Hudson heard him. I'll cut you a deal. I'll sell it to you for 3000 but you've got to pay me today. 3000 Hudson blew out through his mustache. That was way less than they were even going to get paid for tearing the house down, much less the amount that they could have made on building a new house in its place. But he knew that glint in the boss's eye, it was the same look that Bolson had when he found that stray dog a few months back, declaring that it would be their new mascot. Now that he decided to take pity on the man looking to buy the house, there would be no turning back. The man stood in silence for a long moment before nodding quickly. Yeah, of course. Give me just a few minutes. I'll get the money. He turned and Hudson saw his face. He was a young man with strikingly blue eyes and not even a day's worth of scruff on his face. The man nodded at Hudson before hurrying past him. A moment later, Hudson could hear his boots on the bridge, leading back towards the village proper. Hudson looked at Bolson, who grinned and shrugged. I never could resist a handsome young man in need. Hudson scoffed. Oh, don't look at me like that, Bolson said, waggling a finger at Hudson in a scolding manner. Besides, this way you can start on your next project all the sooner. He had to admit, that was a positive outcome. His next job, which would require traveling to the Akala Highlands, would be far more challenging and hopefully rewarding than tearing down an old house. He finally shrugged his acknowledgement, which earned him an eye roll from Bolson, 
who walked past him, patting his arm. Break time, he called out in his sing-song voice. Carson, why don't you put on some tea? Hudson watched the boss prance away, and blew out one final breath through his mustache. He couldn't help but give a small smile, however. For his quirks, Bolson was an excellent boss, business manager, and friend. Hudson reckoned that he would follow Bolson into the Calamity's Maw if he had to. A few days later, Hudson sat on a horse-drawn cart at the head of a small team of men and women, several horses, and a few mules. The morning sun had just risen over the sea to the east, and the cool breeze that blew down from Mount Laneru to the north was not quite enough to banish the sun's warmth from his bare arms. The day was clear, save for a few puffy white clouds overhead. He could smell the fresh loaf of bread that Bolson had baked for him sitting wrapped in the bag next to him. Now, be careful on the roads, Hudson, Bolson said from beside the cart, one hand on the sanded wood of the seat. Now that the day had come for Hudson to depart, he suddenly seemed very hesitant about sending him on his way. He looked worried. I'll be fine, Hudson said. In truth, the reason he'd brought so many men was because of the concerns over the safety of the roads. Selma had assured them that the roads north towards Zora's Domain and the Akala Highlands were usually safe enough, as long as travelers had enough strong-looking men with heavy objects. However, she also expressed concern over increasing boldness of some bandits of bow goblins lately, telling them of one such encounter that happened near the Kakarika Bridge. I know you will be. Bolson patted the cart, taking a couple of steps back. He took a deep breath, regaining control over his concerns, and smiled up at Hudson bittersweetly. If all went according to plan, it would very well could be a long time before they saw each other again. The trip to Akala Highlands was not a short one, after all, and both of them would be busy in the months to come, with summer rapidly approaching. Carson walked up to stand beside Bolson, beaming. Hudson smiled a little under his mustache. The boy was just earnest enough to probably get along just fine with the boss in his absence. Now remember, when you hire someone new, make sure they are a good, proper match for the Bolson Construction Company, Bolson said, eyes twinkling with a certain mischief. Of course, boss, Hudson said, nodding. Though his demeanor did not always show it, Bolson took his employee guidelines very seriously. Good. Now... Bolson took a deep breath, looking over at Carson and gave him a short nod. They both looked back at Hudson and then together began to dance. The dance, which involved much waving of arms and swaying of hips, had been gaining in popularity among the members of the Bolson Construction Company, not to mention the local children of Hatano Village. As they danced, they both began to sing the tune that Bolson had declared to be his company's theme song. With love, courage, and hopeful hearts, we give every house a new start. Bolson and Carson both sang loudly, swaying back and forth in time with each other. That name again is Bolson. Yeah, yeah, ba 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 Bolson. Construction. Bolson. Construction. The short tune and dance ended as they turned side to side, knees bent slightly, waving their arms and gyrated their hips. Several nearby children cheered, clapping and running up to Bolson, who beamed and patted their heads affectionately. Carson, for his part, seemed very uncomfortable around the children, not at all sure how to act around them, but grinned all the same. Sighing heavily, Hudson sat up straighter in his seat, looking down at Bolson and smiling. He raised his hand in farewell. Bolson stood up straight, waving his hand enthusiastically. Goodbye, Hudson. Have safe travels. I will see you again soon. Don't worry. Hudson lowered his hand, nodded toward Carson, who was now surrounded by children, who seemed to sense his reticence, and therefore wanted to be around him even more, and clicked his tongue. He snapped the reins in his hands, and the horse began pulling his cart down the hill, away from Hatano Village. Part 2 Worka The bow coblin on the ridge overlooking the valley, west of Hatano Village, suddenly began to jump up and down, pointing down into the valley and babbling. It had in one hand an only slightly broken looking glass, used to surveil the distant village. Beside it sat a tall dark-skinned moblin, with a broken horn, which used one of its massive hands to block the light of the rising sun. An enormous golden-maned lionel walked up to the bridge, which sat behind the massive stone tower, 
which had a name that none of the gathered creatures knew. The Lionel was old and scarred. One of his eyes was milky white and blind, with a scar stretching from the top of his scalp, across the eye, and down his cheek. One of his horns was half gone. His chest bore the scars of years of battle. Stabs, cuts, burns all rent his flesh and fur. Yet he lived on, which was less than what could be said about those that left the scars. In the tongues of the beasts, the Lionel's name was Worka. With an angry grunt, Worka took the looking glass from the Bokoblin, who backed away quickly, lest he incur the notorious wrath of their leader. The Lionel lifted it to his remaining good eye, looking at a small caravan of carts and Hylians left the village, traveling northwest out of the valley. After a few moments, he lowered the looking glass, tapping it with one of his long claws thoughtfully. Leave them, he finally said in a low growl. He thrust the looking glass back towards the Bokoblin with instructions to inform him of anything else out of the ordinary. Worker turned his back on the relieved-looking Bokoblin and the sleepy Moblin, stalking back down from the ridge to the growing encampment at the base of the tower. Their numbers were growing. The tower sat at the top of a tall cliff, but his camp extended all the way down to the small forest at its base. Multiple cook fires littered the grassy ridgeline, with woodland animals of multiple varieties being cooked and eaten. At one of the cook fires, an exceptionally tall moblin lost her temper at one of the bow coblins near her and stood, grabbing the bow coblin by his head. Worker watched impassively as the moblin threw the bow coblin, whose arms flailed in panic, off a cliff down into a depression with a pond at the bottom. The bow coblin screamed all the way down. Several other moblins cheered her, while the other bow coblins around this particular cook fire decided to move on to a cook fire containing friendlier and smaller individuals. Worka watched this with some pride. He did not discourage in fighting amongst his growing army. No, rather he encouraged it, wanting his fighters to be as savage as they were fearsome. For too long his people had been hunted and shunned by the Herulian races. There were so few of the proud Lionels left, but that would change. It would change soon. In the meantime, he would continue to watch, train, and gather more forces. Part 3 Koga Master Koga steepled his long aged fingers, looking through his mask at the two members of his clan that kneeled on the floor beside him. Torches dimly lit the stone walls of the small chamber that sat at the center of this clan, his kingdom. Tapestries of various colors lined his walls, including one that showed a giant dark-skinned pig-like creature wielding a trident. Directly above his cushioned throne sat his symbol, the inverted eye of the Yiga clan. His Yiga clan. Smiling from behind his white mask emblazoned with the same symbol, Master Koga slowly rose from his throne. He stepped down from the dais, walking slowly around the two members of his clan that kneeled on the floor. Their masks had been removed, as was customary in the presence of their leader. He clasped his hands behind his back, turning away from them. Let them sweat, unaware if he was pleased or displeased by the message they had just delivered. In truth, he was displeased in their performance. He just hadn't decided what to do with them yet. He had expected them to return with news of the destruction of Zora's domain. He had certainly served it up on a silver platter for those disgusting Lazalfos. He had equipped them with better weapons and tactics, given them scores of shock arrows, and even had his agents remove the Zora sentries from the equation. The Lizalfos should have served as a perfect distraction for the Zora, allowing his agents to destroy the dam and flood both of the disgusting races away. The plan was perfect. Foolproof, Koga thought, scowling. But somehow, that boy had foiled everything. Worse yet, he had even somehow calmed that divine beast. Koga's hands, still behind his back, balled into fists. It was, of course, the same boy that his spy in Kokorika Village had reported to him. Blue tunic, long, dirty blonde hair, blue eyes, claiming to be the hero of legend that had supposedly died 100 years prior. Assuming his story was true, the boy had somehow been saved and preserved for the last 100 years. That fool, Impa, had apparently known about it. Though the Yiga 
had never been able to get even a hint of the boy's survival. It was infuriating to know that Impa had actually kept such a secret. Had she really gone the last 100 years without telling anyone? Surely if she had, he would have certainly heard. Even the faithful Shika occasionally got too drunk at the tavern after all. This was of course, if the story was even true. He had his doubts. Still though, he thought as he looked up to the tapestry that showed the dark-skinned creature. If it is true, maybe it's a sign. Will the Calamity finally rise again to meet this new enemy? He walked slowly around the room, pausing by a pair of sickles hanging on the wall. He reached up with one finger, running it along the cool black metal. Of course, it was only cool because he was here, deep within his underground fortress. Had it been outside, in the torturous heat of the desert sun, it would have burned his finger at the touch. Releasing a scream of frustration, Koga grabbed the sickle from the wall, ripping it free of its supports. He turned, staring at the two kneeling clan members, who to their credit did not turn or panic at his weapon. He could see the signs of their fear, though. A slight tremor in the arm, a pulsing vein in the neck, a held breath. Perhaps he should just kill one of them. The whispers at the back of his mind certainly suggested he do so. They had failed him, after all. Worst of all, the Zora had detected the sabotage, and they had reported increased security at the dams. The Zora knew of some form of outside sabotage. Not surprising considering how stupid the Lazolfos were. It made no sense that they would be intelligent enough to come up with as good a plan as he had. I should have thought of that, he mused, gazing down at the black metal. I'm too genius, too... superior. Should have dumbed down my plan for the dim-witted. Then they wouldn't have all failed me. They failed me. He would not kill these two. Not today, anyway. There were few that had actually seen the resurrected boy with their own eyes. He would need them for now. Koga whirled away from them, stabbing the sickle into one of the hanging tapestries. Its point hit the stone wall behind the tapestry, the force of the impact wrenching the sickle from his hand. It clattered noisily on the ground. Clenching his hands into tight fists, he turned away from the fallen sickle, walking away with a stiff back. He moved back to his throne, setting back into it with a sigh. Unlike most of the rest of his haven, his throne was covered in soft, plus fabric. It felt like a chair that royalty would sit in. Fitting, then, that he was the one who sat in it. You both will take a team of Yiga out into Hyrule. Find this boy. Confirm his identity. And when you have him, kill him. After he is gone, report back to me with who he truly was. If this is the hero of legend come back, it could mean that Calamity Ganon is likewise preparing for its return. That would be interesting. Koga wondered what he would have his Yiga do if Ganon did, in fact, return. Would he dutifully serve the monster? Perhaps. For a time. He doubted that he would have the patience to serve under another for long, though. He supposed that he would have to kill the creature eventually. Perhaps then the whispers would stop. His two scouts stood up straight, folding their hands together behind their ribs, and bowed before standing back up. Together, they backed away and walked purposefully out of the room, replaced by a tall Yiga woman named Haya. This one did not remove her mask. A slight, but Koga would allow it for her. She was his top lieutenant, after all. So... Is it true? she asked. Has the hero truly returned from the dead? Perhaps. Koga seepled his fingers over his stomach, which puffed out only slightly. If so, our plans do not change. In fact, if he is going around, taming the divine beasts, then it is even more imperative that we succeed. I agree, Master Koga. That is why I have ordered our spies among the Gerudo to act. Good. When will they return with the Thunderhelm? You should expect them to return within the week. Excellent, Master Koga nodded thoughtfully. Without the Thunderhelm in their possession, the Gerudo would be helpless against their own divine beast, 
which had recently awakened. Its sandstorm and lightning strikes would serve the Yiga clan well as they began to enact their extended plans for gaining control over the various regions in Hyrule. Zora's domain was a setback, but the Zora would be dealt with in time. Perhaps he would control all of Hyrule by the time Ganon rose again. If so, perhaps it would be Ganon who was forced to bend the knee to Koga's might, rather than the alternative. King Koga did have a nice ring to it, after all. Underneath his white mask, Koga smiled. Part 4 Cass Cass smiled down at the beautiful structures of Zora's domain from atop the ridge west of the city. He had left early that morning, saying his farewells to Prince Sidon and the other Zora, whose presence he had enjoyed while taking up residence in the city. He had not finished the song he promised to write for Sidon, but planned to return once his song had been completed. Perhaps he would be able to travel with his wife and daughters by then. It certainly seemed like a possibility, given recent events. Link had left two days prior, riding out of Zora's domain on his horse, packs laden with gifts of dried fish and other gifts. Cass noted a significant difference in the way the man was viewed among the Zora after the events of the Divine Beast, and their newfound warmth was not directed towards Link alone. The Zora suddenly seemed that much warmer to members of all of the races as well. Certainly, he had felt even more welcome than before, and Cass had even overheard Prince Sidon discussing ways to secure more of the waterways outside Zora's domain. It seemed like a very real possibility that the peoples of Hyrule may finally begin to push back against the pain and sadness that had permeated the land for the last century. It gave Cass hope to think that his daughters may be able to grow up in a land full of new life and joy, to give them a chance to live their lives out from under the terrible threat of Calamity Ganon and his minions. That was the greatest gift that Cass could wish for them. Of course, his own part in the narrative was small, but he would play it to the best of his abilities. Here in Zora's domain, the Zora people finally had hope again. Cass could work with that. He could make something of that. Link would make his trip towards the Gorons next, and as much as Cass wished he could follow Link for the sake of seeing his accomplishments firsthand, he knew that there were other things that he could do instead. Besides, he had already visited the Gorons in the past to discuss their deceased champion, so it would make little sense to revisit them. He would travel south to visit the Hylian and Sheikah people. They would likely already heard of Link's accomplishments from his own mouth, how wonderful would it be for Cass to have a device such as the Sheikah Slate? But Cass doubted that many of the common folk had heard it yet. A few nights in the inns and stables would do the people their good. After that, he imagined that he would travel west to the desert. He would not be allowed entry into the Gerudo city, but he would still have an audience outside the city. The Gerudo women may not allow males into their cities very often, but they appreciated music as much as any of the other races. He was in for a long journey, even by flight. Still, it would be good to stretch his wings again, after being grounded for so long as he had been, thanks to the rain. He had worried that his concertina would have been damaged by the moisture, but his weatherproof case held up well, keeping the sensitive instrument dry. The sun felt warm and inviting. The weather was perfect for flight. As he walked up the hills northwest of Zora's domain, preparing himself to take flight, where his difficulty in gaining rapid altitude would not be a hindrance, he wondered when he would meet Link again. He was, of course, quite certain that their paths would cross again, and likely in the near future. But when that future would take place, Cass was not certain. He took a deep breath, spreading his wings to their full ten-foot span. He angled himself so that the wind would help him gain speed and altitude, and then began running forward, flapping his wings. His feet left the ground, and he straightened them behind him as he flapped again, skimming ten feet over the grass. Within a few moments, he caught a pocket of rising warm air, which helped him soar over the cliffs, overlooking the Akala Highlands. After he cleared the cliffs, he banked right, looping around Ploymus Mountain, where he had witnessed Link's defeat of the Lionel. What a glorious battle that had been. He began to review his memories of the event, humming the song he was working on to accompany the tale. He passed over the eastern reservoir, where he could see the divine beast, Varuta, still stationed, waiting her summons to go into battle for Link. 
Cass wondered if Link truly understood the effect that he had on people. It was more than his accomplishments. Even before defeating the Lionel and taming the Divine Beast, he had been able to inspire courage in both Sedan and Cass himself. His simple confidence brought such change in people's demeanor. His very presence meant hope. It was no wonder that the princess fell in love with him all those years ago. Perhaps Cass would tell Link that story someday. What he knew of it anyway. He smiled as he angled into the wind, expertly adjusting his wing and tail feathers just right to catch the breeze. He quickly gained altitude, soaring high above the green land far below. It felt good to fly so freely, when doing so near his home was so dangerous due to their own divine beast. It would be good when Link made his way to Rito Village, to Free Meadow. <laughs>